to see her at the hospital. Well, of course, I was very excited, as you can imagine, being able to uh, go, first of all, to New York, and beyond that, to Moscow, where the theater was a much talked about thing. The Moscow Art Theater is one of the finest in the world. And it sort of set me off on my acting career, and I thought, now, finally, I'm about to become an actress. And yes. I stayed in New York when I got back. Still, as it turned out, this trip had an all-important bearing on the course of your life, Francis. On the ship coming home, you met a young medical student who introduced you to an important New York producer, Francis. Do you remember? The voice of a college friend of yours in whose apartment you stayed. In New York, in that summer of 1935, she stood by you in the good years in the lean. An important New York stage, television, and motion picture actress herself. Here from New York is Jane Finn Rose. <laughs> happened awfully fast. Won't you be seated there by Thank Francis, you. Jane? I... Uh, after uh, Francis met this New York producer, didn't they, Jane? Oh, I should say <laughs> they did. You know, she was tested by Paramount Pictures, and they rushed off the test to Hollywood, and, well, they liked what they saw. And before Francis even knew what had happened, I think she found herself in Hollywood being groomed for stardom. Enough to turn any 21-year-old girl's head. But you attacked the movies, Francis, with serious intent and earnestness under the tutelage of uh, your good friend Phyllis Lawton, Mrs. George Seaton, who's in our audience here tonight, by the way, uh, right up there. <laughs> with such pictures as Rhythm on the Range with Bing Crosby, Come and Get It with Edward Arnold, uh, Toast of New York with Cary Grant, and Ebb Tide with Ray Milland. You're acclaimed by some critics as a successor to the great Garbo, a frightening challenge to a mere beginner, wouldn't you say, Jane? Yes, I think so, and I think Francis felt it keenly. She was always very serious about her work, Ralph, and well, she didn't think she was ready. She wanted more training, and so she wanted to go to New York and get the kind of training that she thought only the New York stage could provide. Stardom in the movies as against greatness on the stage. This mental dilemma is now your constant companion, Francis. But thank you, Jane Finn Rose of New York, for your part in your friend Francis Farmer's life. This year you are. It's not our task, Francis, to comment clinically on the tensions that have beset you since your childhood, but they've been mounting, as we've seen, a girlhood without a father in the home, the rebellion of your teenage years, brought on by the uncertainty born of the Depression, the quest for truth in your college days, which always somehow eluded you, and now a new conflict in your career as an actress. But there's still one hour or so of respite before the final storm unleashes itself in its full fury. These are the happy years of your marriage to Lythe Erickson. Your dream of stardom on Broadway is crowned by your success in Clifford Odette's great uh, hit, Golden Boy. But somehow your world just will not hold together. Why did your marriage to Lythe fail, Francis? Well, I, I guess neither one of us really should have married each other. We, he wasn't to blame and neither was I. We had different goals and different directions, and we realized that uh, we'd be better to uh, just to let the marriage uh, go and go on our separate ways, and it was a very difficult emotional decision for both of us, but uh, we did get divorced, and we've been divorced ever since. In Hollywood, your friends blame you for the breakup of your marriage. Up in Seattle, your family, too, say the fault is yours. Your nerves are stretched tight, almost to the breaking point. On the sound stages, your brilliant mind fails you now, and you become more and more uncooperative, less and less competent. Resentment against you mounts in all quarters until no more parts are offered you. In loneliness and despair, you turn to drink to blot out the raging conflicts of your mind. In October of 1942, you're picked up for drunk driving in Santa Monica and are placed on probation. When you break that probation only two months later, you react violently to being put in jail. You're completely without funds, so your family comes to your side, and psychological tests indicate that you're suffering from schizophrenia, hallucinations, fantastic delusions, and disorganized emotions. So instead of being an alcoholic, as was so widely thought, you were actually seriously ill mentally. So Francis was placed in a private sanitarium in San Fernando Valley. Well, here to be at your side now, as she always has been, is your half-sister who took care of you and helped support the family in your childhood, Rita, Mrs. James Will of Anaheim, California. Yeah. Here's Rita. You sit down there by Francis, Rita. 
Why don't you go around and just sit beside uh, Francis for a moment? How long did uh, Francis stay in this uh, sanitarium, Rita? Oh, about three months, I think. Mm -hmm. The uh, patients there were given a great deal of freedom, and one day Francis just walked out from the sanitarium and, and uh, appeared at my house in Santa Monica. Oh, it was 15 miles distant. She walked every bit of the way. And after that? And after that, my mother came down from Seattle and took her back with her north. And uh, none of us fully realized at the time that Frances was a very sick girl. Do you want to tell us what happened then, Frances? Well, you know, I didn't think then, and I still don't, that I was actually sick, but... There were so many people who, who seemed to think I was mentally ill that I just had to find out why and, and find out whether it was my fault, what was happening. It, uh, you know, if you get treated like a patient, why, you have to act like one. And uh, these things just pushed me a little too far and uh, it led to conflicts and strife with my mother. She thought I needed more care and... So she had me committed to the Western State Hospital in Washington. This was on March 23rd, 1944. And with your hospitalization, having been legally declared mentally incompetent, you lose all your civil rights and were to be in and out of that institution for the next six years. How you fight to regain your health and how you finally win a new life, we'll learn in just a moment. Well, Ralph, it was very much like anyone else is, is admitted to a, a public institution. Uh, they don't have means for uh, individual psychiatric care. There are only so many beds available. I stood in line with uh, 15 or 20 girls, uh, like myself, in the hospital for one reason or another. We received shots or hydrotherapy baths or electric shock treatments, and this was supposed to relax the tensions and keep us quiet, which it did. I don't blame the hospital at all. I think they did everything in their power to uh, take care of the enormous number of people they had. But I really don't think it, it, it helped me much. Yes. Now, of course, uh, had you had money, you could have had uh, psychiatric... Uh, well, that's problem. the problem with people who have no money at all. There's no other recourse except to an a institution like this. And uh, it means that you have to be able to afford proper analysis that could help. Have you any thoughts, Francis, on how your cure came about on your recovery? Well, it took me a long time going this way, and uh, finally I, I realized that I would have to do it for myself. Because first of all, any cure to be effective has to be based on faith in oneself, uh, which means faith in God. If you don't have that, why uh, all the... Uh, Tensions that are relaxed till the end of the world won't solve your problems for you. The reason why you are emotionally disturbed. I was able, in a kind of a grim and very lonely battle, to find this faith for myself or refind it and to hang on to it. And it eventually led me out of the hospital and back to church, which I think is the only place where you can find a really potent answer to the problems of, of the spirit in this world that we live in now. Your faith is rewarded when you're discharged from the Western State Hospital as recovered. Your civil rights are restored in March of 1951. Your first concern here in 1951, Francis, is your mother. So you get a job in the Olympic Hotel in Seattle. What did you do there? Oh, I was taken on as a clerk uh, in the valet department. Uh. When your mother goes to live with your sister Rita, there's nothing to hold you in Seattle. So in 1954, you take a bookkeeping job in a photographic shop in Eureka, California. And there you meet a man who's to play an important part on your road back, a radio management consultant from San Francisco. Here he is, your personal manager, Mr. Lee Meitzel. Here's Lee. <laughs> Francis to return to the movies and stage, didn't you, Lee? That's right, Ralph. I did. Yes, indeed. She was rather reluctant at first. And it was only after she went to San Francisco and was an employee of the Sheridan Palace Hotel uh, that a columnist there uh, identified her. Yes. And uh, after that, the International News Service, IP, UP, and AP all wanted stories. So we gave them to them. We got a flood of mail and 
That was the beginning of it. And to help you answer that mail uh, were your neighbors. And here they are from San Francisco, Mr. and Mrs. Harry Haste. Here are Mabel and Harry. <laughs> you knew Francis briefly in Seattle, didn't you, Harry? Yes, I did, Ralph. And uh, when uh, our apartment manager told me there was a celebrity in the house, we got together. <laughs> Then the flood of mail started. Well, all I could do was try to help to pitch in. And I've been doing it ever since. Well, your friend uh, Mabel may have taken on quite a job, Francis, because we've wired 125 Hollywood producers urging them to look in on This Is Your Life Tonight and to keep you in mind for an important dramatic role. Uh, so it looks like you're going to be a busy gal, too, Francis, dashing from interview to interview. And we know that you've been depending on your friends for transportation, and so Pace wants to give you a helping hand. And so does the Edsel Division of the Ford Motor Company by presenting you with this beautiful 1958 two-door Edsel Pacer. With its exceptional power, ease of handling, and above all dependability, this Edsel will uh, get you wherever you want to go. How about that? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> this car is your very own to drive home tonight, Francis. And now, as your sisters and friends gather around you, I'm sure they join me in wishing you only the best in your new career. Mom and Dad, were they alive today, would be mighty proud of their girl. Now, we know that all over the country, millions of people are waiting to welcome you to the screen and to the stage. You've already distinguished yourself on television, on The Ed Sullivan Show, on Playhouse 90, and on NBC's Matinee Theater, as well as at the Bucks County Playhouse in the Chalk Garden. You'll be equally distinguished, we're sure, on Broadway soon, because uh, you've been offered a number of plays, notably the starring role in Eddie Dowling's production of, of The Passions of the Women of Glynn. Congratulations to you. Your life certainly proves the great need for a sympathetic understanding of the mentally ill as patients, not outcasts. And so, Francis Farmer, one book is closed now, its pages sealed, but another lies wide open before you. And with faith in God and confidence in yourself, it'll be a great book. This is your life. Good night. God bless you. This was one of our most rewarding and touching shows. In speaking with a family member regarding our adding Francis Farmer's life to our classics, I was told that it would be wonderful to set the record straight once again as to what Francis's life really was. We're pleased you could join us for this show and hope you'll join us for the next edition of This Is Your Life, The Classics.